Should I use the mic or can you hear me? Speak loud. Speak loud? Yeah. So, based on fieldwork in Armenia from the past three summers, this presentation will discuss some key features in the contemporary life of what I termed the Azgabirakan movement, a revival of rural Armenian folk music and dance. This movement is a network of decentralized agents, including performers, scholars, and activists, who practice, spread, and develop staged and socio-participatory performances in the Azgabirakan idiom. Examining this revival within histories of genocide, Sovietization, Armenia's independence, and the conflict of Karabakh. This research conceptualizes the Azgabirakan movement as a socio-aesthetic phenomenon that mobilizes, through its expressive capacities, sentiments of a decolonial and irredentist cultural nationalism. Folklore revival movements have played an immense role in shaping ethnic and national identities throughout the 20th century. Although each revival is unique in its own context of development, ethnomusicology literature demonstrates an important unifying theme um, across cases, that revival movements mobilize efforts of preservation as strategies for transforming social conditions that are perceived to have adverse effects on their community. For example, the reference to African roots was a constructive element in black American culture in the 1960s civil rights movement as was the reemergence of indigenous music and dance in the reclamation of tribal identity and sovereignty. Similarly, the Azgagirakan movement developed as a heritage activity, reviving rural for forms of Armenian music and dance as signifiers of national consciousness in opposition to the aesthetic ideals institutionalized by the Soviet state. The Azgagirakan movement crystallized in Soviet Armenia during the 1960s when drastic polit political changes, social reforms, and intellectual developments ensued the collapse of Stalin's authoritarian reign. As deliberated by political historian Ronald Sunni, quote, post-Stalin society constantly tested the limits of expression and occasionally moved beyond those set by the state. It was in 1965, during the pinnacle of this socio-political climate, when the first Azgagirakan icon, Haidik Muradian was broadcasted into the public domain. A historian and folklorist, Haidik was a refugee of the Armenian Genocide who performed folk songs from his village of Shatakh throughout Soviet Armenia. An advocate for traditional Armenian song, Haidik was seen as an emancipator of the Armenian national cause, musically invoking the very sentiments that had been violently suppressed during decades of Soviet-sanctioned denationalization. In 2017, I interviewed Akbong Azgagirakan Ensemble, founded in 1976 by Haidik's daughter, and spoke with veteran folk singer Adek Mikhailian, who has emphasized that, quote, people were afraid to sing during the communist period, but we weren't, and this was due to the courage put forth by Haidik. Considering this historical context, it appears that the emergence of Azgagirakan performances in the post-Stalin era were expressive analogs of what Ronald Sunni calls dissident nationalism, when national pride and patriotic glorifications of the past were put into action against Soviet orthodoxy. The paramount episode of these actions took place on April 24, 1965, when a mass demonstration of over 100,000 Armenians assembled to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Marking the first protest in all of, Soviet, in all of the Soviet Union, <coughs> Armenian protesters employed visual and sonic tactics of dis disobedience, evoking irredentist claims to the Western Armenian homeland, while mobilizing demands of recognition and justice from the Soviet state. The rise of Armenian nationalism began to subvert the ideological and political purview of the Soviet state, which had until this point coercively su suppressed issues of national interest. The Azgagirakan movement further extended this process into the aesthetic domains of Armenian expressive culture. Establishing rural folklore as the ideal embodiment of the national cause, Azgagirakan activists advanced a decolonial approach to performing Ar Armenianness in alterity to Eurocentric Soviet ideals. In order to examine the political implications put forth by the Azgagirakan idiom 
it is important to consider it in relation to the Soviet state ensemble idiom. Evidently, these diverging trajectories of folklorization appear to be expressive outputs of competing political dispositions that have shaped distinct and often polarized representations of folk in contemporary Armenian society. Adapted from the political discourse of Romantic nationalism, the concept of folk comprised a, collect a cohesive motif in the semiotic amalgam of Soviet propaganda. Constructing a glorified embodiment of the proletariat, the motif of folk engendered broad aspects of the Soviet project, from economic policies to the arts. Soviet authorities resorted, resorted to extreme and often violent measures to ensure that the production and consumption of art conformed to party ideals. In fact, the presentation of art may have been one of the first measures to first measures of introducing state ideology to the public. Dance was certainly no exception to this. According to dance ethnologist Anthony Shea, quote, no nation in the history of the world has invested in dance to the extent that the former Soviet Union did. At its core, Soviet ideology was guided by social evolutionary visions. Soviets maintained that art was to be progressive in the sense that it should build upon previously acquired knowledge to yield higher stages of cultural development for the realization of communism. Thus, dance in the Soviet Union was built upon the historic lineage of Russian ballet, but since communism objected, objected to classical ballet for its ties to bourgeois culture, the artistic solution of Soviet choreographers was to infuse ballet as a kinesthetic form with socialist realism. This, ide this ideological position was preeminently realized by the ballet master Igor Mosiev, who engineered a new idiom of folk dance based on the movement vocabulary of character dance, a subset of Romantic era ballet. Appointed in 1936 as director of the newfound state folk ensemble, Mosiev's socialist rebranding of character dance was part of a state initiative that institutionally redefined the concept of folk and employed it to achieve a spectacle of masses demonstrating support for the Soviet system. Personal accounts from Soviet ethnomusicologists revealed, revealed how state impositions of music and dance were artificial processes that changed the local traditions and cultural perceptions of those who were subjected to it. Evidently, these policies were forms of Western cultural imperialism implemented by the Central Soviet as a means of improving what they considered to be primitive musical cultures, resulting in broad artistic standardizations across a diverse cultural geography. These policies function to mitigate national differences while asserting administrative control over republics. By the 1950s, every Soviet republic had formed a central folk dance company in the Mosiev image, while the state began to systematically regulate other choreographic outputs to conform to the Mosia idiom. Formed in 1958, the state dance ensemble of Armenia formally domesticated the Mosia idiom into its Armenian form. Consequently, Soviet definitions of folk came to dominate representations of the Armenian self, a phenomenon that endures decades after Soviet collapse. As Gagarakan activists recall Soviet cultural policies to have had devastating impacts on the productive outlets of Armenian existence. They view Soviet impositions of folk dance to be part of a larger colonial agenda of assimilation and national suppression designed to strip Armenians of their bodily powers as a mechanism for subordinating them to Soviet rule. Forming an embodied response to these measures of Sovietization as Gagarakan performers aspire for indigenous attributes in their representations of Armenianness, reclaiming traits that were once ridiculed by Soviets as remnants of an outdated primitive culture. The As Gagarakan idiom is thus a decolonial practice, rooting the mass-bearing Armenian body into the ground, contrary to the light, elevated European body promoted in Soviet policy. Regarding methodology and ideology, Gomitas's model of Armenian national folklore was the conceptual impetus 
for the formation of an ethnographic or asgagadak on idiom. Glorifying the Armenian gerjog or peasant as the idyllic bearer of Armenian heritage, asgagadakan performances are directly informed by oral traditions of rural Armenian music and dance. Information from culture bearers, ethnographic documents, and folklorists have been vital for the development of an ethnographic repertoire and performance practice. Motivated to safeguard traditions from the losses suffered from genocide, Soviet rule, and currently due to media modernization, the Azgagarakan idiom has functioned as an embodied display of our lineal integrity across time and geopolitical space. In acting what political theorist John Hutchinson refers to as cultural nationalism, the Azgagarakan movement is an integrated force that puts forth the creative vision of the nation through reviving a love and knowledge of a common history and culture across varying sectors of community life. As opposed to the top-down edicts of Soviet folklore, Azgagrakan efforts have been historically organized via grassroots avenues. Emerging in the 1970s, the first generation of Azgagrakan ensembles developed from community workshops organized by Haidik Muradyan in universities throughout Yerevan. Grassroots workshops continue to be core strategies in the current life of the movement as mass, mass assemblies of people turn parks, city squares, and church courtyards into sites of socio-participatory dance. Cultivating Azgagrakan consciousness throughout the public domain, the civic outreach activities, these civic outreach activities, have been viable modes of reviving socio-participatory productions of Armenian folk music and dance. In an interview I condu conducted with the famous singer Nersi Kispiria, he expressed that the current rise of revival is linked to the ongoing conflict of Karabakh. The downfall of the Soviet Union in 1991 marked a new <laughs> geopolitical dynamic for Armenia. <laughs> Burdened by institutional and economic collapse, Armenia declared independence in the wake of the Karabakh conflict, the first of several ethno-territorial disputes demarcating the dissolution of the Soviet Union. The Karabakh war had embodied impacts on the Azgagrakan idiom, which resurfaced in post-Armenia with a new aesthetic vision armed by a heightened affinity for martial representations. In attending Azgagrakan functions across the last three summers in Armenia, I realized that revolutionary songs and war dances comprise the climax of every occasion, whether a concert or a community gathering. We get some sound maybe? Ginosian is vocal about shedding the flimsy acrobatics inherited from Soviet ballet in the embodied actualization of Armenian identity. Through Gari, Ginosian has developed a keen specialization in the performance of Razmapad, or war dances. Gari's exhilarating performances and methodic efforts of civic engagement have achieved nationwide and even international spread of Azgagrakan consciousness. Gaudin's activities have also contributed to the current popularization of kocharis, a category of dance defined by embodied representations of the ram. Believed to be rooted in Armenia's pre-Christian animistic practices, kocharis are recognized by a gesture <coughs> referred, referred 
to as Hoya Hare, a forward thrusting body lunge resembling the charging headbutt of a battling ram. Let's watch some um, videos from. Furthermore, Kocharis in Armenia are markers of exile, originating from Muj, Sasun, Garin, Sareti, Bulanuk, Alashgert, and Van, which were all violently cleansed of Armenian inhabit inhabitants during the genocide. Accordingly, Ginosyan advances sentiments of territorial integrity while teaching Kochari, providing the narrative that Aram fights to protect its family and territory from intruding attacks. Learning Garno Kochari myself in 2016 in a class led by Garin member Adno. I recall his in instruction to keep close as we interlocked fingers and stood tightly conjoined at the shoulders, forming a fortress like wall we imagined to be physically impenetrable by intrusion. The shoulder to shoulder formation of Garno Kochari physically embodies the poetic idiom of Armenian lore emphasizes values of collaborative cooperation and unity. Asgagarakan performances of Kochari are thus collective embodied actions through which performers harness the animistic vigor of the ram and channel it for the protection and liberation of the Armenian homeland. In a conversation I had with David, a teenage Zurna player from Haidik Murad Yanzon Van Ensemble, he explained that, quote, the current climate of war we face today requires our people to be united. Being on stage with an Azgagarakan ensemble is already a fight in itself. We imagine how we would play in the circumstances of war, how we would dance before arriving to the battlefield. The tense condition of Araba keeps us in this mindset. Of all the Razmapars, Yarfushta is especially important for marking the climax of almost every social function in the Azgagadagan community. The martial value of Yarkushta is fortified by its ethnographic origin in Sasun, memorialized in national narrative as the legendary stronghold of Armenian resistance during, the, during Ottoman rule. According to the community, Yarkushta, among other Razmapars, were historically performed by Armenians before going into battle. choreographic gestures from the eagle, the Yarkushta is said to embody the animal spirit that represents the most iconic fedais, more, more, more memorialized for their devotional armed defense of the Armenian homeland. Embodying the ideals of liberation, dynamic performances of Yarkushta yield heightened states of national vehemence. Venerating the historic struggles of Sasun, Azgagaragan performances of Yarkushta occasion spectacular displays of irredentism by bodily mobilizing territorial claims to the Armenian homeland, currently under Turkish occupation. In conclusion, the Azgagarakan revival has shaped the resilient sense of Armenianness through a performance practice that
that signifies ancestral and territorial integrity. Embodying indigenous representations of rural folklore and alterity to the Soviet folk, the movement has asserted its own national vision of self-determination in opposition to the colonial impositions of the Soviet project. Developing into its current phase of militancy after the Karabakh War, Azgagrakan representations have become vivid displays of national strength in pursuit of geopolitical goals. In reviving traditions from loss, Azgagrakan performances assert notions of embodied struggle for the recovery of the lost homeland. As an expressive strategy for advancing the Armenian national cause, the Azgagrakan idiom is a socio-aesthetic phenomenon that mobilizes sentiments of a decolonial and irredentist cultural nationalism. Empowering performers and spectators alike, the aesthetic and, ideal, the aesthetic and ideological implications of the Azgagrakan idiom are engendering widespread impacts on Armenian culture at large, as seen in paintings and various other cultural productions. Currently diffusing into the diaspora, Azgagrakan activities are establishing yet a new dynamic phase of transnational networks, certainly worthy of further study. Thank you.